I do want to talk uh, at least a couple of lectures now on uh, evolutionary trees. Okay. Especially since you're already doing something with them. So everybody here, I assume, knows what evolutionary trees are about, uh, the sort of the tree-like nature, the proposed tree-like nature of evolution. And um, uh, so I won't tell you what they're supposed to be uh, representing and doing for us, but just the issue of uh, how, how we use molecular sequence data and how we use bioinformatics to, um, to build trees. All right. And I'm going to talk really um, uh, about some ideal principles in building trees. Tree building algorithms, uh, perhaps more than, than the sequence analysis algorithms, have an underlying justification uh, that's really very, very nicely worked out and quite elegant mathematically. However, that all assumes perfect data. And so uh, the reality of, of evolutionary tree algorithms is that you're always fighting noise. You're always fighting things that, where the data is not perfect, the data is not clean, or uh, the, sequ the data doesn't exactly fit the model. But it's really quite useful to have the model under the clean data, under the perfect data, understood first. And then you can kind of see how everything was a little uh, deviation from the, the clean data case. So. The cleanest situation is what's called ultrametric, ultrametric data and ultrametric trees, or ultrametric distances and ultrametric trees. Okay. So let me give you a definition. Um, D is a symmetric n by n matrix. Okay. Um, of numbers, well, positive numbers, non negative anyway. Um, okay, an ultrametric tree for D is the following beast. T contains N leaves, so N is the same N here. It has one leaf for each row. each row of D. Okay. Um, to each internal node, that is a node that's not a leaf, has exactly two children. So there's going to be a root of this tree and then that root has two children, and each one of those have two children, unless they're a leaf. Okay? So, um, each node, each internal node, has a, a number labeling it. Okay, and these must strictly decrease as you go from the root. Strictly decrease uh, on paths from the root. Well, That's a lot of words. I'm going to get to an example in a minute, but um, on paths from the root. of T 
And finally, for, for any two leaves, I and J of that tree T, Dij, remember D? That's what we started with, this matrix D. Dij is the number written at the least common ancestor, the closest common ancestor. of I and J in T. That's a lot of words. Nobody should understand this at the moment. Hopefully, after I go through an example and we walk through the definition, you'll say, oh, of course. OK, so here's an example. OK, so we have A, B, C. That's that represents uh, a column, not the whole matrix D. A, B, C, D, E. Okay. And here are some numbers. 0, 8, 8, 5, 3, 0, 3, 8, 8. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, leaves, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so n leaves. Each leaf is going to represent uh, one row. Is it this way, A, E, D, B, C. Okay, each node is supposed to have a number. So 8, 5, 3, 3. So for example, like that. Okay, so let's see, this is my T. So here we have a D, here's T. This example is in the notes that's on the, that, are, that will be on the web. So T contains N leaves, one for each row, yep. Each internal node has exactly two children, yep. Each internal node has a number labeling it, that's true. And the numbers strictly decrease if you walk from the root. The root is up at the top. These are trees. I don't know why they are always drawn upside down, but you know, dead trees, I guess. Uh, they strictly decrease on paths from the root. Yep, that holds. And the most important one, for any two leaves I and J, Dij, that's the number that was given in the matrix, is also the number written at the least common ancestor of I and J in T. So, for example, let's say BD. That's an 8. You look at B and you look at D. What's their least common ancestor? The nearest answer, ancestor, it's that one. And this is 8. And that's what was in the table. OK? Uh, let's take say another one. DE, that's 5. D and E, their common ancestor, least common ancestor is here. And 5 is written there. OK? And that's what's written there. Okay, so this is called a uh, ultrametric tree for D. And if if D has an ultrametric tree, then D is called an ultrametric matrix or Ultrametric yeah, matrix, if you like, or this is called ultrametric data 
or these, this data has ultrametric distances, whatever you like. Um, okay, now I'll tell you probably next time the mathematics about ultrametrics, but what's this got to do with evolution? Hmm? Common ancestry says that's certainly there. I mean, here's, an, here's something which probably is going to be interpreted as an evolutionary tree, and we have common ancestry is something that's useful because evolution is uh, is considered to be a a, uh, a process that splits apart. You know, species speciate; they they split apart. Of course, that's not totally true. Things do come back together. Uh, you know, certainly in bacteria or plants, you have lateral gene transfer. You got all kinds of things that that don't follow this model, but at the species level, uh, this is uh, sort of the model that people accept of evolution. But what are these numbers? And, um, uh, well, if this is the root, and this is, this is the past, if you will, okay, you can interpret these numbers, let's say, as the time uh, in the past where this event happened, the time, how far back in time did uh, s the speciation event occur? Okay, so this is time going like that. And here's sort of the present. And so we're saying, well, species B and C branched out, branched away from each other three units away, th three units ago. I don't know what the time units are. Are they generations? Are they years? Are they millions of years? Or whatever, it doesn't matter for the purpose of the abstraction. It's some time unit in the past, three of them ago. All right? And so um, these conditions really tell you that... Uh, that an ultrametric tree is, uh, th these are natural definitions if you want an ultrametric tree to somehow be reflective of evolutionary history, okay? You have N species that you're looking at today. Well, they're the leaves of some tree because that's what we have. The tree generated what we're looking at today. Each internal node has two children because the general belief is uh, that you have bifurcation, things split into twos, um, although sometimes you don't have enough data to see them splitting two ways. You may see them splitting three ways just because you don't have enough data to, dis to distinguish. Each internal node has a number labeling it, and they have to st strictly decrease. Well, if the numbers labeling it are time, time in the past, time uh, in the past when some event occurred, then of course they have to strictly decrease. The tree is supposed to happen... Uh, the events in the tree are supposed to be chronological. They're supposed to, the tree is reflective of time passing. And this one just says that uh, we have some data here that relate to pairwise distances between these species. This is not, we have no tree yet. We just have some data which says, well, I think C and D diverged from each other longer ago in the past than, let's say, B and C, okay? I have some numbers here which, which sort of estimate how far back in time do we think that these two species diverged. How different are they today may be the indication of how far back they are, how far back the divergence was. And if you can use these numbers to create an evolutionary, a, a ultrametric tree, then you're pretty impressed that maybe these really are uh, the, uh, uh, this really is the tree that explains where, this, where these numbers came from, where these distances between species came from. Okay? That part will become a little clearer uh, after I tell you a particular theorem about ultrametric trees. But is everybody clear at least a little bit on the motivation why if I have these kinds of numbers and I can build a tree for it, then this tree is sort of a, is a hypothesis 
um, the evolution, uh, the evolutionary history that produced these times or these times back in in, uh, in the past. Anybody want to ask a question about that? Okay, well, where do these numbers come from? If we're trying to understand this this whole, um, not the mathematics of this yet, or the algorithms involved, but just to understand what this is trying to tell us or why this arises, wh where are these from? One way it's what? Those are distances from where? Um, yeah, okay. These typically, I mean, uh, you know, I want people to, to just think of this fresh, but in fact, if you already know where these kinds of numbers come from, it should make sense as well. These numbers typically come today from sequence alignment methods. So you align some sequences from, uh, or, or a sequence, maybe it's a particular protein sequence of species A with everybody, with, with a uh, sequence for the same protein, for example from uh, species B, C, D, and E, okay? And you get these distances. Or, you know, th distances could be, I mean, people sometimes use very simple things, such as number of uh, uh, insertions and deletions and number of spaces. But usually it's a little more sophisticated. It has to do with, with substitution matrices and so on. I mean, you throw in all of the stuff we've been talking about all quarter, okay? But now we're talking about distances, um, so a large number means that they're different, whereas we started off in this uh, quarter talking about similarities where a large number means they're very similar. But you can flip those around, okay? So we're just saying A and B have a difference or a distance which is given by this number 8. And so do A and C, but A and, let's say A and, B, but A and D are only a 5, and A and E are only a 3. Okay, so from sequence comparisons, you get some numbers that reflect the di the pairwise distances, and then you would try to build a tree like this, where those numbers exactly show up at the interior nodes of this tree. Now in lab, we tried something like this. Well. You're actually, in lab, you're actually using, um, in Philip, they're not building ultrametric trees. But as I said, we're, we're looking at the ideal case. And the real algorithms that people use have to deal with the fact that data is not always ideal. But we are, in, in, the, um, in the lab, using distance data to build evolutionary trees. And where did that distance data come from? It came from two different possibilities. One was the program that I wrote and had you use, which was just exactly as I was saying, computing pairwise distances by uh, sequence alignment. Pairwise distances uh, of the sequences that were given to you. I think you had eight of them. Okay, so you ran my little program. You got out a table of, of distances. The numbers were bigger. They were in the 400s and 500s or whatever, but same idea. And then that set of distances was being fed to a program which ideally, by the way, would have built an ultrametric tree if it was possible, but deals with the fact that the data may not actually fit an ultrametric tree. That was one possibility. The other one went through Klostal. And Klostal was doing what was originally suggested here was that it was building a multiple alignment first of all the sequences. And from that multiple alignment, it was computing induced distances. Remember back when we were talking about a multiple alignment, talked about induced distances or induced pairwise alignments? So it had the multiple alignment from Klostal, and then for each pair, it, there's an induced alignment and therefore an induced distance. And from those induced distances, it was building a tree. And in your lab, you're comparing whether those two trees uh, how similar or how different they looked. And I think in the lab I ask you why does, why bother to build the multiple alignment first and then get induced distances instead of just using direct pairwise distances? I don't have an answer to that, by the way. 
Uh, it's just, in fact, the first time I used Phylip a couple of years ago in this class, I'd never used it before, but we had a lab, and I could never have imagined that they insisted on having a multiple alignment first, and there was everybody there trying to make it work, and I hadn't read in the tutorial that you needed a multiple alignment first. I thought you just uh, it would work on the raw data. Anyway, it requires a multiple alignment first. And you should think about how that um, might distort the end result you get as opposed to doing pairwise distance uh, computations. So next time I'll tell you about the mathematics of ultrametrics and why they're very, very special and it's unlikely that your, your, raw, your raw data is going to fit that and therefore why people use other algorithms. <laughs>